If this year could be summed up with just one image, it might look something like this. Derailed, a train carrying chemicals crashing, some of the train cars littering a road. Residents, businesses, and two schools within a mile radius evacuated as a precaution. Thankfully, no injuries have been reported. Face off in Florida, President Trump and Joe Biden hitting the Sunshine State at the same time today, campaigning hard for that crucial electoral college prize. And as the country breaks a new record with more than half a million COVID cases this week, the president dismissing criticism of his handling of the pandemic, hoping his large rallies translate to enthusiasm at the polls. We know the disease, we social distance, we do all of the things that you have to do. If you get close, wear a mask. Biden accusing Trump of spreading the virus as well as negativity. President Trump's super spreader events that he's spreading more virus around the country and here in Florida today, he's spreading division in addition. Hurricane Zeta's deadly destruction, several people killed in the south by falling trees, powerful winds ripping buildings apart, homes flooded, leaving millions in the dark. Terror in France. French President Macron declaring his country under attack. Three people killed, several wounded inside a church in Nice, apparently in the name of Islam, what we're now learning. Meanwhile, Europe's COVID crisis is spiraling, providing a foreboding picture of things to come in the U.S. We'll take you to the town at the center of the potentially deadlier second wave. Economic mirage, signs of record growth while millions of American families are suffering. With more than 750,000 filing unemployment claims last week, are we really on the mend? And taking the plunge, our Maggie Rooley dives in with some wild swimmers who say their lives have been transformed by swimming outside 365 days. Cold, just looking at that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Just five days to go until Election Day, and both campaigns are boots on the ground in the Sunshine State of Florida. President Trump and former Vice President Biden both targeting Tampa today, making their case to voters in this all-important battleground state, both with entirely different approaches to the pandemic, which continues to loom large over the election. Very few undecided voters left at this point. This final stretch is really all about ramping up voter turnout, and Americans are are responding with record numbers. More than 80 million early votes have already been cast. Our chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl, leads us off. Trump, Biden, today, same time, same place, Florida. In campaign 2020, no state looms larger. Ladies and gentlemen, the heart and soul of this country is at stake right here in Florida. It's up to you. You hold the key. If Florida goes blue, it's over. It's over. And that's almost certainly true. To get reelected, President Trump must win Florida. There's no state he has visited more. Heck, he even became a Florida resident. In Tampa today, he was joined by the First Lady. This is like home. This is home. Right? This is home. Today, the president had something worth boasting about. A new report shows the economy grew at a record 33.1 percent in the third quarter as the country began recovering from the even steeper losses triggered by the COVID-19 shutdown. They say talk about your economic success. Talk about 33.1 percent, the greatest in history. Now, look, if I do, I mean, how many times can I say it? I'll say it five or six times during the speech, 33.1. But there's another big number for the United States today, more than 85,000 new COVID cases in a single day. And the nation's jobs crisis is far from over. 751,000 Americans filed for unemployment just last week. Biden told Floridians there's only one way to turn things around, get control of the pandemic. Millions of people out there are out of work, on the edge, can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and Donald Trump has given up. Infections are now on the rise again in Florida, even as the president insists the nation is rounding the turn. Now in the campaign's final week, the president is trying to outrun the virus, holding one giant rally after another. Biden calls them super spreader events, but the Trump campaign sees them as key to getting Trump supporters to vote. Here in Florida, the president's making a direct appeal to Latinos. We're going 
are going to win a record share of the Hispanic American vote. You see what's happening? He's also been trying to win back women, but he often steps on his own message. Overnight in Arizona, the president sounded irritated as he called to the stage one of the year's most vulnerable Republican women senators. Martha, come up just fast. Quick, come. Fast. Fast, come on, quick. You got one minute. One minute, Martha's sake. They don't want to hear this, Martha. Come on, let's go. Quick, 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 quick. Come on, let's go. All right. I'm coming. Thank you, President Trump. As the candidates race around the country, voters are turning out in droves. Here in Tampa, you don't even need to get out of your car to drop off your mail-in ballot. Right, sealed and delivered. More than 7 million Floridians have already voted, 75% of the total who voted in 2016. Why did you decide to bring it in person? Because I wanted to make sure that it was counted. People really going that extra mile to ensure that their vote is counted. Jonathan Carl joins us now from the Biden rally in Tampa. And John, that record early vote is really quite something. Florida, of course, is often a major focus on election night. So with all those early ballots, when do we expect that we're actually going to know the results in Florida? And, and where do the polls stand there right now? Well, the one good thing about Florida now, perhaps in contrast to what we saw in the 2000 uh, election, uh, where the recount went on and on and on, is they actually count the vote pretty quickly here uh, in Florida. The early vote, they don't wait until the end to start counting it. Uh, they get going early. Uh, there are three new polls out, Lindsay, just today of Florida voters. All three of them show a slight lead for Joe Biden within the margin of error. The 538 election forecast gives Biden Biden also a slight advantage, about a two out of three chance of winning the state. But I've got to tell you, there is no question that there is a lot of enthusiasm in this state for Donald Trump. As you heard uh, in the story, he has been here more than any other state. And Democrats and Republicans who I have spoken to, operatives working on the campaign here, agree on one thing, and that is that Donald Trump has a good chance, a very good chance of winning Florida. Of course, it's a state that he absolutely has to win. Though we hear those uh, horns honking behind you for Joe Biden yes. there. Jonathan <laughs> Carl, thanks so much. And of course, be sure to tune in next Tuesday night for our full coverage of election night. I'll join George Stephanopoulos, David Muir, and our powerhouse political team bringing you the results of this monumental election. The battleground blitz taking place as we receive those fresh economic numbers today. But many American families have yet to feel any relief, and negotiations on a new stimulus package are stalled in Washington. More than 22 million are now receiving state and federal unemployment benefits. And a troubling recent report, more than 8 million families across the U.S. have actually fallen into poverty since May. That's when the last round of stimulus money went out. And to help us break down the economic growth and unemployment data that came out today, we now bring in ABC's economic and business correspondent, Deirdre Bolton. Thanks so much for joining us, Deirdre. So 33.1% annualized growth was the highest quarterly GDP growth on record, but still more than 750,000 Americans filed new unemployment claims in a week. And we're hearing about massive layoffs, of course, in the restaurant, hospitality, and airline industries, just to name a few. So is the U.S. economy really on the mend? Lindsay, there are some bright spots and there are some headwinds. One quick detail I want to give about this third quarter number, which was a record quarter, but so was the second quarter and in the other direction. So if you look at this year so far, net net, growth wise, we are still behind. We are still behind even where we finished the year in 2019. So that just implies how long we have to go before we get back to a growth period that is consistent, that most economists and most experts say is healthy for the US economy. I want to tell you about the bright spots, though, because they were there. So you do have a certain amount of strength in personal consumer spending. That's two thirds worth of our GDP. That's what we all collectively, of course, spend. And that was really a bright spot. The other two bright spots, business investment and housing. We have the Fed to thank for that, which has kept rates low. Why do we care about that? It makes all borrowing cheaper. It's stimulative. So the Fed's moves have really underpinned the economy. Now, on the headwind side, we have seen so many people lose jobs. You referenced that, of course, Lindsay. And then also keep in mind the conditions that we are now in were supported in a good way by stimulus, 
which no longer exists. So in speaking with numerous people, they say, listen, it is just going to take us a long time to get back to where we were pre-virus. And, and I know you said a long time, but of course you've been speaking with economists all day. What are they predicting about U.S. economic growth over the next few months, and, and when can we expect to get back to our pre-pandemic economy? Lindsay, the theme is uncertainty, and these are all people who sift through this data with such a meticulous eye for detail, and it's really uncertain because the number of cases of the virus are growing in the U.S., they are certainly growing in Europe, and that really does affect how we all feel about spending, and then, of course, it affects industries, so we can think of travel, leisure, hospitality, all of those industries, the longer they stay on the ropes, just the less certain it is. I did speak with Michelle Meyer, at least one of note, a U.S head of economics at Bank of America. She said she is forecasting, if things were to stay the same, slow growth for this fourth quarter and then through the first quarter of next year. But I think most people saying, listen, to really clear the decks, you have to wait till the end of 2021, Lindsay. Deirdre Bolton, thanks so much for your help with uh, breaking it down for us. About this time last night, Hurricane Zeta was racing through the Gulf Coast with powerful winds just shy of a Category 3. Today, people in that region have been assessing the damage, surveying scenes like this flooded parking garage. Now, that storm is racing across the country, dumping rain here in New York and along the East Coast. But before we get to the forecast, our Rob Marciano, who was in the thick of it last night, has more on Zeta and its deadly rampage over the past 24 hours. Tonight, after a stunning late-season landfall in Louisiana, Zeta continues its path of destruction, knocking out power to millions. Multiple people killed by falling trees in the Atlanta area. It basically tore out a large chunk of the front of this mobile home, killing a man who was asleep. Power knocked out to some early voting locations in Georgia just days before the election. Zeta coming ashore as a powerful Category 2 hurricane south of New Orleans. We've already had winds gusting over 100 miles an hour south of here. You can see the winds ripping down Canal Street. Over eight feet of storm surge in Mississippi. and Biloxi, this family rescued from high water. We woke up and the house was flooding. And we were all scared because the water was coming in really fast and we didn't know what to do. Daylight revealing destruction in Gulfport. Boats pushed into the parking lots. There is damage and debris across the city of New Orleans. The winds were so strong here, they were able to rip the roof right off this two-story apartment building. Brian Ellis was badly hurt by the flying debris. I'm glad that somebody witnessed it and came out and called the ambulance. Unfortunately, some not as fortunate there. Hard to imagine five massive storms all in one season. Rob Marciano has been there for much of it. And Rob, how are you guys doing after last night? And what's next for the remnants of the storm? Well, uh, you know, we, we're recovering just fine. We got banged around quite a bit, but nothing like the, the what the residents of not just New Orleans have to deal with, but of Mississippi, Alabama, and here in Georgia, they had over 50 mile an hour winds. You see this massive tree behind me slicing through the second uh, floor of this home. Luckily, the owners of this home were out of town, so a very fortunate situation here. We're not quite done with Zeta yet. It's now uh, rocketing northeast. It's now already into the Atlantic, just off the coast of New Jersey, and it's brought a lot of heavier rain from Philly to New York to Boston. Boston still doing that in Albany and some wind alerts, very dynamic system on the backside. It is still very, very windy uh, and cold air is going to catch up with this tonight and more moisture will come in as well. And we're going to see some snow mixing in in the northeast all the way down to, to some of the New York suburbs inland. We will see some accumulation of an inch or two of wet snow, but a lot of trees uh, still have their leaves on. So that might see more in the way of power outages there. This all the while, guess what? Another uh, system in the tropics that we're watching closely, this one in the eastern Caribbean, but Supposed to go to the Western Caribbean, that's close to the Gulf of Mexico, which always is worrisome. We still have yet, uh, you know, another month of hurricane season left, and it's obviously been very active this for this year. And when, the last time we had a, a season this active was 2005, and we were getting storms well into uh, November. So uh, this isn't that surprising, though. We are certainly wishing it away from the Gulf of Mexico, Lindsay. Right, but no signs of letting up. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, our thanks to you.
And now to our nation's ongoing crisis with the coronavirus pandemic. Today, as the country tops a half million new cases, the CDC provided a sad and grim scenario for the upcoming holiday season by announcing we may reach up to 250,000 American lives lost by Thanksgiving. That's almost the entire population of Reno, Nevada. This is cities like El Paso and states across the Midwest continue to be ravaged by the virus. Our Matt Gutman has the latest from Idaho. Tonight, a staggering 85,000 new COVID cases in the U.S. reported in just the last day. An American testing positive every 1.2 seconds and dying from the virus every 107 seconds. Our patients are so sick. They're struggling to breathe. We wish that we could do more. We have treatments that we can provide, but it's not enough. We really need to stop the spread. Wisconsin running out of ICU beds. At least six Midwestern states today hitting record new case numbers. El Paso County, Texas, now weighing a full shutdown for its 800,000 residents as surge tents go up to ease the pressure on overwhelmed hospitals. Doctors warn we could see lockdowns again if we don't mask and social distance. This is exactly what we want to avoid before we go into the Thanksgiving and the holidays. We do not want to have to uh, look into a lockdown, but that's where we're heading if we don't act urgently. In Idaho, where some hospitals are near capacity, some patients doubled up in rooms. All of us are by nature free and equal. And yet, the lieutenant governor and a group of legislators putting out a video and claiming their own state's COVID restrictions violate their rights. Among which are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing happiness and securing safety. The fact that a pandemic may or may not be occurring changes nothing about the meaning or intent of the state constitution. In the college town of Rexburg, with one of the highest COVID rates in the country, many cavalier about mask wearing. I don't really think students, students, I don't think we care. Yeah, I've already had corona. So I'm still reluctant to wear a mask. Matt Gutman joins us now from Idaho. Matt, talk to us about mask compliance there and what you've seen in that region of the country. There's a lot less mass compliance here in Idaho than anywhere else I've seen in the country so far. And you know, we've reported for your show from all over the country. Um, people don't like wearing it here. They feel in many ways that it violates their state and constitutional rights. Um, they don't like to see a mask mandate. And so walking around here, you'll see about 50% of the people not wearing a mask, uh, not just outdoors, but in supermarkets and hardware stores. Uh, lots of college kids not wearing masks. And there's an interesting phenomenon here in Rexburg. It has um, the single highest COVID rate in the country, according to the New York Times. But that hospital behind me is not overflowing. It's not even near capacity at this point because most of the people who are getting sick are young people and they're getting over it quickly. And that's actually encouraging people to think, well, you know, this COVID thing can't be that serious if I'm getting over it in just a couple of days. Um, what's the point of wearing a mask? So it's a sort of, uh, you know, this vicious circle that happens here. Um, politicians and local leaders are trying to instill the notion that the science is real. The more you wear the mask, the less the virus will spread, the more quickly all of us will come out of the lockdown. But they are finding tremendous resistance to that. Lindsay. But personal liberties aside, Matt, I, I am assuming that business owners also are not requiring it. You know, walking around New York, for example, many of the businesses have a sign that say no mask, no service. I guess you're not seeing that there. You see some of the opposite signs here in Idaho. You see, you don't have to wear a mask to go in. Uh, the no mask says it, you, wow. know, you don't have to wear a mask. In fact, those two young women that I spoke to, they said not once in their entire time, they're from California and Arizona, but not once in their entire time in Utah, here in Rexburg, have they ever been asked to put a mask on when they go inside a restaurant or a supermarket. It's hard to believe. Hard to believe indeed. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. When we come back, the road rage shooting in Houston, the driver seen pointing his gun out of the window. The major FBI warning to U.S. hospitals, could your personal information be at risk from Russian-speaking cyber gangs? But up next, our journey to the Belgian town, where you're more likely to have a positive COVID test than anywhere else in Europe as that continent battles a second and potentially deadlier wave. Stay with us. Our time, anytime. 
Nightline. COVID-19. What can you do to help protect yourself? Where can you get your questions answered? The new daily podcast from ABC News with Dr. Jennifer Ashton and a team of experts. Listen free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Ismael? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you for Thank you. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A family on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Cross my office up the list. What if we pick for each other? Please stop. Houston police are looking for a driver. They say open fire on a couple on a Texas highway. It allegedly began when both cars bumped into each other while merging. The driver could be seen pointing his gun at the passenger window. Fortunately, no one was hurt in the incident. Imagine testing positive for COVID-19 and then reporting right back to work. That's the stark reality facing health care workers in one Belgian town where hospitals ICUs are filling up. This all comes as nearby France and Germany impose new lockdowns. Well, here in the U.S. cases surged over the summer. That was not the case in Europe. So how did the virus get so out of control there so fast? James Longman reports. Belgium heard the second wave coming, but it's hit harder than anyone expected. This is Liège, the city where more COVID tests come back positive than anywhere else in Europe. Patients sharing hospital rooms, a healthcare system on the brink of collapse. Yeah, it was a distressing sound. The patient inside is clearly in some discomfort. This small room, two COVID-19 patients are being treated, trying to make sure they don't end up in the ICU. But as we're standing here, we're seeing ambulances roll up outside through the windows. Belgium is now in the midst of a deadly second wave of COVID. The positivity rate in Liège is a whopping 41%. Health professionals in the country are sounding the alarm, warning if the situation persists, it's only a matter of days until the country runs out of ICU beds. And this is what you call the war zone line. Yeah. That's the war zone. Yeah. Do you really think that the second wave is going to be worse than the first? It is. It's already worse. It's already worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Staff shortages are so severe, Dr. Sasha Guisen is one of the many doctors who had to keep working even after he tested positive for the virus. And it, it, it's, it's an ethical dilemma, really. And, you know, usually in the ethical dilemma, there is one bad option and one is worse. And sometimes we feel that, is there any more? Any more good options? There are no more good options. No. But because we have to take care of these patients, and it's better having you COVID positive, uh, asymptomatic with your complete protective equipment than, than nobody. Officials in Belgium relaxed the more rigorous safety measures that had kept them safe, and now they're paying the price. They were forced to reverse course, imposing a new wave of restrictions, a national lockdown now on the horizon. Belgium is recording the most COVID cases per capita in Europe and a death rate second only to the Czech Republic. The country Minister of Public Health visibly emotional after an official visit to a hospital. What I've seen here was very painful. I find that very shocking. There is a suffering of the patients, of the loved ones who are invisible. There is huge commitment here, so it's hard. It's hard. Donc, uh, oui, c'est dur. C'est dur. 
Record daily cases are haunting European countries. In France, President Emmanuel Macron announcing a four-week nationwide lockdown. Débordé par une deuxième vague. Overwhelmed by a second wave that we now know will probably be harder and more deadly than the first. We were in an ICU in Lyon, France, last week and saw firsthand how swiftly the tide can change. In one 24-hour period, they saw over 30,000. Now, that's because a lot more people are getting tested, but they are seeing an increase in hospitals as well. And this ICU went to 75% capacity. They were so worried they had to increase the number of beds on this ward. In Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel shutting down restaurants, bars, gyms and theatres starting Monday. If the pace of infections continues like this, then we'll reach the limits of what the health system can manage within weeks. Officials are pleading with an exhausted population. The economic and emotional toll of further lockdowns is too much to bear. It's a shame because I personally need cultural activities to clear my head to get through the situation. I do not see where the risk is when we go to the movies or the theater while respecting the safety measures. I do not understand. As the virus continues to prey on the elderly and high-risk populations in Belgium, a silver lining. Florent is a 75-year-old patient on the mend. He may not have survived in March, but better treatment now means he will. And it's his birthday today. What do you want the most for your anniversary, Monsieur? Returner. Returner chez vous. I said, what do you wish the most for your birthday? It's his birthday today. He said, just to go home, really. Better care, but with climbing numbers, hospitals across Europe are worried they won't cope this winter. James Longman in Liège, Belgium, for ABC News Live. Our thanks to James for that. And still ahead here on Fun, the horrific terror attack. Three people killed inside a church by a knife-wielding man. Now France has issued its highest terrorism threat level. Our look at the first case facing this new Supreme Court mixing religious liberty and non-discrimination against LGBTQ families. Can a Catholic church social service agency be denied contracts because it refuses to help same-sex couples adopt? But first, our tweet of the day. Today, October 29th, is Latina Equal Pay Day. It marks the one one year, 10 months, and 29 days that it took the average Hispanic woman to catch up to what the average white male earned in 2019. More on the economy coming up after the break. In times like these, the newsmaking events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong Un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7. ABC News. There for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts.
Welcome back, everybody. And now back to the U.S. economy, which is top of mind for so many American voters still struggling in this downturn. Today, we got new data on U.S. economic growth and unemployment just days before millions head to the polls. Here's a look by the numbers. 751,000 Americans filed new unemployment claims in one week, slightly better than expected, but still the 32nd straight week of historically high unemployment claims. And more than 12 and a half million Americans are currently unemployed. The U.S. economy grew by a record-breaking 33.1% annual rate last quarter as many businesses reopened after the spring lockdowns. But in the previous quarter, the economy shrunk by a record-setting 31.4% annual rate. So all told, the economy has now recovered about two-thirds of what it lost during the pandemic. And we would need about 50% annual growth in GDP to actually claw our way back to our pre-pandemic economic activity. For the full year 2020, the U.S. economy is expected to shrink. And as one economist told us, we may be in for, quote, tragedy in three parts, decline, rapid rebound, and then the long, hard slog. Still have lots to get to here on Prime. The record-shattering early vote in Texas continues, but why what's happening in Houston could have a major impact in that state and potentially the entire country, we'll explain. Plus, our conversation with the woman vying to take Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's Senate seat down in the polls, given very little chance, but why she thinks she can pull it off. And flying cars? Yeah, that's actually a thing. But first, here's a look at some of the trending stories on abcnews.com. of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch ABC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground at the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Biden leads President Trump in most national polls, but the 538 poll average has him separated by just two points in Florida. Both candidates courting voters today in this critical battleground. President Trump making his case on the economy. New numbers out today show third quarter GDP grew by more than 33 percent, a record number after massive losses tied to the pandemic. They won't even talk about it. This is the biggest event in business in 50 years. Nobody's ever seen a number like this. This is bigger than any nation. But economists caution without new COVID-19 economic stimulus and aggressive efforts to reduce the spread of the virus, that growth could shrink. President Trump's response to the pandemic, the crux of Joe Biden's closing argument. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. 
Tonight, France on its highest terror alert level after a deadly rampage inside a church. Authorities say a young man stabbed several people inside the Notre Dame Basilica in Nice this morning, killing three, one woman nearly decapitated. This 55-year-old father of two among the dead. Officers storming the church, opening fire on the suspect, taking him into custody. Police say the 21-year-old attacker was born in Tunisia and was unknown to the intelligence community. Authorities finding a copy of the Quran near the suspect. Tonight, French President Emmanuel Macron deploying an additional 4,000 soldiers to schools and places of worship, saying the country is under attack. France fighting a surge in terror attacks in recent weeks. Just two weeks ago, near Paris, investigators say a man beheaded a teacher who showed his class the controversial cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, published by the satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo in a lesson about free speech. A guilty plea today stemming from the impeachment hearing of President Trump. David Correa, a Florida businessman and one-time golf pro, pleaded guilty to duping investors in a company he founded with Lev Parnas, a former associate of President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. Correa also pleaded guilty to making false statements to the Federal Election Commission about an illegal $325,000 donation arranged by Parnas and co-defendant Igor Fruman to a political action committee supporting the president's re-election. Prosecutors have said Parnas and Fruman worked with Giuliani in Ukraine to dig up dirt on Joe Biden. Federal agencies say cyber criminals are unleashing a major ransomware assault against the U.S. health care system. U.S. hospitals already struggling to treat patients during a global pandemic have a new worry. The FBI and two other federal agencies warning of a major ransomware assault targeting America's health care system. The cyber attacks lock up computers, which can only be unlocked with software keys provided once targets pay up. At least four U.S. hospitals already hobbled this month. Hundreds more could be impacted. Authorities say a Russian-speaking criminal gang is responsible. Despite the U.S. presidential election, it's believed their motive is purely profit. Flying cars getting closer to becoming a reality for public use. New video shows what is called an Aircar V5 on its maiden flight. A Slovakian professor created it. The car can sprout wings in just three minutes and then soar over traffic at 125 miles per hour. The flying car Whoa. could go on sale in the next six months. The FAA is closely monitoring the technology. Admits it's a challenge to update its rules. No word yet on pricing yet, but nothing could possibly go wrong, right? Now to tonight's ballot watch. While Texas has not voted for a Democrat for president since 1976, a major surge in early voting in the Lone Star State is giving Democrats new hope tonight that they could turn the traditionally red state blue next week. A lot of that is due to record voting numbers coming out of Harris County, which is home to Houston. Now, Harris County alone has a higher population than roughly 26 states, and early turnout numbers have now passed the total turnout there in all of 2016. Joining us now is the man in charge of running a elections there, Harris County Clerk Christopher Hollins. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Good to see you this evening. So since taking over earlier this year, you've worked to dramatically expand early voting across Harris County, offering drive through voting. And as of today, eight polling locations will remain open for 36 hours straight until early voting ends tomorrow evening. Why were these such important steps for you? And, and do you anticipate that a lot of voters will cast ballots tonight and late into the night? Yeah, well, democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, we all need to be involved and engaged. And in times like this, we need to be voting for the next generation of leadership in this country and in this state, in this county. And so it's been my honor to expand voting access here in Harris County to levels never seen before in Texas. And the voters have responded by coming out in droves. And we're excited about that. And quickly, what are you expecting total voter turnout in Harris County to be? And, and how does that compare to prior years? Well, as you mentioned, we're passing up now the total voting voting turnout from 2016, which was itself a record. And so we're going to push towards 1.5, 1.6 million at least, uh, which is going to be huge for Harris County and uh, 
you know, folks just want to claim their uh, their seat at the table and have their voices heard, and we're excited to be protecting their rights to vote this fall. Of course, there's been some significant legal limbo over how many drop boxes you can have in Harris County. A court ruling earlier this week upheld Governor Abbott's decision to allow only one drop box per county in Texas. Now, Harris County, as you well know, is larger in area than the state of Rhode Island. So at this point, with faith in the Postal Service down for many people, what's your message to voters who still haven't been, haven't had the opportunity to mail in their absentee ballot just yet? If there's only one drop box, what are their other options? options. Well, we're now within a week of the election. And so uh, at this point, you're putting your vote at risk if you drop it into a mailbox. And so you need to mail it to us in some special way, like priority mail, UPS or FedEx, or take that drive to our headquarters at NRG Arena to come and deliver your ballot. But on election day, we will reopen uh, the 12 drop-off sites for mail ballots. And so we wanna give voters every single opportunity to make sure that that vote gets to us and that we count those votes this November. A lot of eyes will certainly be on your county Tuesday night as results start coming in. Some believe that a big night for Biden in Harris County could actually tip the scale in Texas and, and maybe the whole election. So when do you think that the American public should begin to expect that the majority of the results in Harris County will actually be in? Those results are gonna be out on election night. Uh, these 1.4 million or so early votes will be reported on election night just after the polls close at 7 p.m. And throughout that night, of course, we'll be updating the results with election day totals. And so it may be a lengthy night, but on election night, uh, Tuesday, November 3rd, we will be sharing the results of the Harris County elections. And lastly, we've been talking with election officials all over the country over the past few weeks, and, and I've asked each one of them the same question. What's the number one thing that keeps you up at night with regard to the election? Uh, it's what voters care about, safety and long lines. So we're making sure that we're protecting our voters and our election workers at all 800 of our election day voting sites. And we're gonna make sure that we move those lines along, provide all of the equipment and, and other resources necessary to make sure that those voting centers run smoothly and that we ultimately can report those results out uh, as soon as possible on election night. Christopher Hollins, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Have a good evening. The self-proclaimed head of a white supremacist group who reportedly ran a hate camp and one of his associates have been arrested in Michigan. Authorities say Justin Watkins and Alfred Gorman took this photo at a home where they thought the producer of an Antifa podcast lived, but it turns out that a young family actually lived inside. Watkins and Gorman were charged with multiple crimes. With Justice Amy Coney Barrett now on the Supreme Court, next week the justices will hear their first major case on religious liberty and non-discrimination against LGBTQ families. The case involves foster care in the city of Philadelphia and whether a Catholic social services agency can be denied a contract for child placement because of its refusal to work with same-sex couples. Our Devin Dwyer went to Philadelphia for a closer look at this dispute and the children caught in the middle. For nearly 30 years, Sharon L. Fulton has opened her Philadelphia home to dozens of the city's most vulnerable children. I have room in my house and time in my life and I wanna make a difference. The Catholic mother of three has been a foster mother to more than 40. Her kids coming from families often broken by drugs and abuse. You make them a pie, you kiss them, you tell them it's gonna be all right. And that's how I do. In 2018, Fulton's work as a foster parent for Catholic Social Services was abruptly put on hold after the city froze its contract with the agency over its refusal to work with same-sex couples. I was devastated. I just couldn't believe it. Catholic Social Service does wonderful work, and we have children that hurt, and we need the service. Philadelphia, in a push to recruit more foster families, made clear that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation was forbidden under city contracts. Deputy Mayor Cynthia Figuera, herself a Catholic, told Catholic Social Services it could no longer refuse gay and lesbian parents and continue receiving taxpayer funds. This is a voluntary contract. We don't hold any provider uh, to commit to having to sign if they don't want to adhere to the contract language. So to the city, it's pretty straightforward. 
forward. You've entered into a contract that says very explicitly that you are to serve all and any, um, and that's not that's you know neutrally applied to all providers. The agency and Catholic foster parent Sharon L. Fulton sued the city, alleging they were targeted for their religious beliefs in violation of the First Amendment. Lower federal courts rejected those claims, but now the U.S. Supreme Court will decide whether the city went too far. There had been no complaints against Catholic Social Services, and no same-sex couple had ever approached them, but if one did, they would help them to find an agency who could serve that family and help them on their foster care journey. Of the 24 private agencies in Philadelphia's foster care network, Catholic Social Services is the only one that says it would deny applications from same-sex couples as a matter of faith. Even because there's other organizations doesn't mean that one should be allowed to discriminate against a particular community. Why freeze them out at a time when you have so much need? There's LGBTQ youth in the system, and I think it sends a very strong message to them that they're supported and protected as children, but as adults, their right would be discriminated against. Caught in the middle are at-risk Philadelphia children and teens. There are currently 4,300 kids in the city's resource homes, including nearly 1,900 with foster families. About 300 children are in group facilities awaiting placement. We have kids dying in the street every single day. Multiple. And you want to fight about who can uh, foster a child? By God, let's get past that. Retired cop Kevin Bernard and his wife Patty recently became foster parents for the first time, taking in a five-month-old baby girl from a family with close ties to their church. We don't really know what the outcome's going to be. We don't know if she's going to be with us for two years, for a year and a half, forever. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen. What's it take to be a good foster parent? Oh, um, I would say, you know, have love and um, patience. There's such a need for people that have a heart to help the children to be involved in the system. Was that a difficult... Paige and Shannon Davis have been sharing their love with Philadelphia foster kids for seven years, taking in 10 children and teens while raising a son of their own. We don't call them foster kids. They're our kids. As soon as they come to our home, they're kids. They're our kids. The Davises say having same-sex parents in the foster system is critical. Studies show LGBT young people are disproportionately in need of foster care and that many who were removed or ran away from foster placements did so because of a caregiver's hostility to their sexual orientation or gender identity. We could have been that intermediate between a child transitioning into their adulthood and into their own identity and show them that it's safe. We want to be there for those children in order to do that. I'm not a lawyer, but I say this. Catholic Services, they signed a contract. The contract specifically states that you're going to include all type of families. But after nearly 200 years of Catholic Social Services working with children and families in Philly, some wonder whether the move to cut ties over their beliefs on homosexuality is fair and constitutional. It's freedom is both sides. Mm. There's two sides of freedom, right? And this country was founded on religious freedom. And as such, you should be able to help where you can help and still practice your faith. And so if the church wants to help, but they can't do it in another area, then there should be somebody that can help those people also do that. I grew up Catholic. My wife grew up Christian. We still go to church on Sundays. We take our son. We're a member, part of our Catholic community here in Philadelphia. However, everyone is entitled to their beliefs. However, this is about the children. This is not about what we do behind closed doors. So for you to add or eliminate families based on them being same sex is eliminating a potential loving home for a child. Yes. With her case before the Supreme Court, Sharon L. Fulton awaits a decision at her now quiet North Philly home. The trees her foster children planted still blooming as a source of hope. If Catholic Social Services loses the case and the city's rules are upheld, would you continue fostering with, a, with another agency? No, I would not because at this age and in my life, I don't want to start all over again with somebody else's rules and regulations who don't respect my religious values. And I believe in that, that, what I'm saying. So, no, it would be difficult for me. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Philadelphia. It is indeed all about the children. Our thanks to Devin for that. And turning now to the battle for the Senate, Amy McGrath is trying to do what six Democratic candidates have not been able to do for the last 36 years, defeat Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. She joins us now. Thanks so much for your time, especially during these busy last few days of the campaign.
Well, we're working very hard. People I, are excited. I can imagine. So in 2016, President Trump won Kentucky by 30 points. 538 gives the president a 99 in 100 chance of winning the state again. How many Trump supporters do you need to win over in order to have a shot at beating Mitch McConnell? Well, you know what? My message has always been, um, let's elect somebody who's going to put this country above their political party. And I, I will work with any president to do what's right for Kentucky. So, you know, there are a lot of people, no matter who they're going to vote for for president, recognize that Mitch McConnell, that Senator McConnell has been there too long, uh, that he is part of a dysfunctional system that is so partisan and so polarized and so dysfunctional that it can't even get anything done for Kentucky in the middle of a national security crisis that we have right now with COVID-19. And so that message is resonating. And, you know, it, it comes down to, look, you want to drain the swamp? You can't drain the swamp until you get rid of the guy that built it. And that's Mitch McConnell. But part of being there too long, he has been able to amass a lot of power, right? So what would you say to a Kentucky resident who enjoys having the most powerful Republican in Congress representing them? Should voters give up having a top party leader from their state for a new senator who will have less influence? Well, you know what? Uh, my fellow Kentuckians don't come up to me and say, wow, Senator McConnell's power is really working for us. You know what people care about here right now? Um, folks can't afford their prescription medication. They can't pay the rent. Um, we are, we're trying to get kids back in school, and, and a lot of people don't have broadband, so their kids have to go to McDonald's uh, to do their homework. You know, we have a health care problem here in this country. We have 300,000 Kentuckians that still don't have health care, and Senator McConnell wants to take away health care from people. So it's, it's bread and butter, butter issues. And what I say to folks is it's not about the power. It's how you, it's how you use that power. Senator McConnell uses his power for himself, special interests, the wealthiest 1%. He does not use it for Kentucky. And in fact, we get rid of him, we can get lower prescription drug prices, we can have better health care, we can invest in us, because he's holding all of that up right now. And Mitch McConnell has said that he considers the confirmation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett a major accomplishment that cannot be undone. If you do get to the Senate, will you back efforts from progressive Democrats to get rid of the filibuster or expand the Supreme Court? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not interested in, in packing courts right now. Um, I'm interested in unpacking the Senate because the reason we are in the position that we are in right now uh, is because of Senator Mitch McConnell. He has polarized and destroyed this process from the very beginning. So the first step to getting our democracy back is getting rid of him. And I will, I will say that we have to fix this. A new generation of leaders is going to have to look at our democracy and fix it because Senator McConnell has destroyed it. It was once the greatest deliberative body on the, on the planet, and now it can't even get us the aid that we de need in the middle of a national security crisis. And the Supreme Court nominee that he just rammed through, it's all about health care. He couldn't take away the Affordable Care Act legislatively for a decade, so now he's trying to do it in the courts. And, you know, people are tired of this. That's why they're going to vote for change here in just a few days. Okay, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show, Amy McGrath. All right, good to talk with you. You also, and when we come back, some do it to get closer to nature, some do it to be daredevils. Meet the group swimming in the most unusual of places. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. We move up to the vehicle. He detonates the bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation, Vans made contact. the takedown of the bomber, now streaming on Hulu.
The coronavirus. Everyone has concerns. And tomorrow, Dr. Jennifer Ashton is here, helping you better understand it all, helping you protect yourself and your family. Your questions answered tomorrow. On Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other show. Thank you for making ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir the most watched show on all of television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Coming up. tell you I'm I'm not not nervous right now are we doing this there I am walking quite awkwardly into a cold blustering English channel at sunrise why you ask let's rewind it's all because of this woman Ruth Rose this is what makes it every morning it's just wonderful <laughs> at 87 years she is the fearless leader of the Seaford mermaids a group of more than 150 people and growing who swim together off the southern coast of England for some it's a chance to get back to nature others say they swim for the myriad of supposed health benefits and for many it's all about the community good morning, good morning. Enjoy, enjoy. Oh, they already did it. <laughs> They've already been in, yes. Friendships built over mornings spent shivering side by side in cold water. And in this swim family, they rely on Ruth. No. She is amazing. <laughs> Every night at 9 o'clock sharp, Ruth uses her skills from when she was a navigator in the Royal Air Force to help read weather patterns and put out a detailed swim forecast for the following morning. The morning we arrive, it was typically British. So that brings us back to this moment. Me as a nervous honorary member of the Seaford Mermaids. So we're here at the beach just before sunrise and look at this. There is already <laughs> more than a dozen swimmers out there in the water. Um, let me tell you, it is cold, it is windy, yet somehow I think every single one of them are smiling. I feel like they're also taunting me right now. The mermaids show up 365 days a year, rain or shine. The water right now is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And because 57 seems like it's going to be warm, but I found out 57 degrees, uh, you lose dexterity and feeling in feet and hands within five to 15 minutes. Look, my Ruth is telling me to come on. <laughs> I follow Ruth in for my first cold water plunge. No wetsuits allowed. <laughs> Warming up after our swim, we meet Joe and her mom. Joe's friend encouraged her to join the mermaids a few months ago after Joe lost her job during the pandemic. Has it made a difference? Do you feel better? Huge, Absolutely. Huge difference. Really? Yeah. Tell me, what's it like? What's the difference? Being like a four-year-old every morning. <laughs> But it gives us reason to get out of bed. Yeah. It's sort of a smugness as well, yes, all day. Smug. That you manage to get up, get in the freezing cold water, and anybody you tell them, like, you're mad, you're crazy. Yeah, basically. For years, cold water swimmers have said the sport is a powerful mood booster. So the things we as scientists are really interested in when we're looking at outdoor swimming and swimming in cold water are the potential for uh, treatment of therapies that could be used within uh, neural degeneration or prevention of neural degeneration and dementia and also in terms of mental health and well-being. Look folks, and one more thing you'll notice about the Seaford mermaids is that almost all of them are women. It's a common trend in wild swimming. Some women say they find it helpful for their chronic 
chronic pain, a condition that disproportionately affects women. Others say it's helped them feel more confident in their bodies. Everybody doesn't care what anybody else looks like. You're not conscious. Yeah, you're not yeah, conscious you're not at conscious all. for your lumps and bumps. And perhaps the other best walking advertisement for cold water wild swimming is Ruth. After our swim, Ruth and I catch up with a full English breakfast. Do you think that cold water swimming helps you be this lively and vivacious at oh, 87? Oh, definitely so. Yeah, yeah definitely come? so. Yeah. It wakes you up so much in the morning that you're invigorated to do things during the day. Some of our swimmers have come to me and said, I used to get depressions, I no longer get them. I used to get aches and pains, I no longer get them. This is not just the cold water swimming, it's the fact that they are in a community that is inter-supporting with one another. I mean, it's fantastic what they'll do for one another. And the community is growing, already gaining in popularity over the past few years. The sport is now exploding under lockdown. Since then, the Seaford mermaids have doubled in size. Ruth reminds us newbies to wild swimming to start slowly, go with someone who is experienced, and be especially cautious about weather conditions in the ocean. But she says that wild swimming is for everyone, no matter their age. They're having fun. It's their childhood started all over again. And as Ruth reminds us, never be afraid to make a splash. Go Maggie. Those mermaids Maggie Ruth, certainly News, young Seaford at England. heart. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. We've all been there, had too much to eat and just kind of needed to kick back, relax. Well, this group of California dogs perfectly capture the mood of overindulgence on Halloween with their candy coma costumes. Their owner assures us, though, no dogs were actually given any candy. <laughs> that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.